Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Pataskala, the first Sunday of May. And today we're going to celebrate our high school and college graduates. Let us begin uh, with a prayer that I found for graduates. Please bow your head. Heavenly Father, surround those who are graduating with your grace. Bless them with hope so that they move into the future with eager and open hearts. Help them to put the knowledge, skills, and insights gained through their education to use for the good of all human kind. Inspire them to believe in the goodness of life, even when faced with challenges and difficulties. As they commence with their lives, may they grow even more grateful and wise. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus, your beloved Son. Amen. Our announcements this morning, of course, since we are um, celebrating our graduates, there will be a small reception up in the fellowship hall for the graduates. Um, they have done a very beautiful job of decorating the fellowship hall. We have a session meeting this Thursday at 6.30 on the 11th. Ken, I gotta thank you. That handrail back here for Marsha's safety is beautiful. Thank you. Uh, so anyone who um, knows Ken, he's, he's the, the finisher upper with the um, beautiful woodwork and he did a very nice job. And it is for Marsha's safety to get her up and down this step that's back here. Um, Robert Holland has a table up in the fellowship hall. It has a bunch of product that he is putting our steeple on or putting First Presbyterian Church on. Um, there's just a whole bunch of stuff. You need to go up there and take a look. If there's anything that you see that you like, uh, he can get it made for you. Um, just bring it in and then um, if you have any ideas let them know let our service begin
Good morning, everyone. I awoke this morning thinking I was going to see a sunny morning and warm temperatures and dressed accordingly, and that's not what I found at all, but I'm not going to be mad at it because I also see the beautiful blossoms that are blooming outside in the way of the flowers and all the good things that God gives. So we are gathered together to bring him praise and show him um, our exaltation and our worship and to glorify him. So let us stand together as a people called to worship here in person and online in Psalm 25 verses 4 through 5. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are my God, say Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. There's an insert in your bulletin, although the other hymns will be from our red hymns of faith. The insert is for our opening song, which is new to you. So Marsha will play this very sh short song once through. Our vocal leaders will then sing it once through. If you know it, you are welcome to join it. And then as a congregation, we will sing it once through. So we would start with Marsha in instrumental one time through. through God our Father to receive glory and honor and praise we have come to confess the ways that we have turned against him so we pause now in silent confession in unison let us pray remember Lord your great mercy and love for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. For the sake of your name, Lord, Forgive my inequity, though it is great. Amen. And having confessed, as we are assured through Jesus Christ, that our confessions will be heard, let us be assured of forgiveness. Hear the good news. Who is in the position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone, a new life has begun. With that, in Christ, know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Amen. <laughs>
In the name of the Lord, we call out to the Lord for his word to be proclaimed today. In unison, we say, Scripture cannot be set aside. What does Scripture say? We have gathered together, O Lord, as your people, looking to hear from you quite clearly. This can only be done through the light and the illumination of your spirit, for we are not able to understand unto ourselves, only through you. So we pray, Lord, for your spirit to fall upon us today, that we might hear the word rightly preached, and that we might hear the word correctly in our own hearing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are on pages 16, 82, and 84, if we turn to our pew Bibles. We are in the midst of the first letter that Paul has written to the Thessalonians. He went to Thessaloniki after going to Philippi. We have learned that it is the leading trade city and financial district in Greece, and still is. So with that in mind, we also have heard that Paul has preached to the people there. And today, the takeaway is, goes and extends last week's message about living life worthy of God. And this week, we receive a word to strengthen and encourage you in faith. It's especially an appropriate word for our graduates that are with us today, for them to know that we extend to them a message to strengthen and encourage them in their faith, but it's also for all of us. So hear now this reading that is before us. I will begin in chapter 2, verse 17, and I'll read through verse 20. But, brothers and sisters, when we were orphaned by being separated for you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again. But Satan blocked our way. For what is our hope, our joy, or crown, in which we will glorify in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? Indeed, you are our glory and joy. And so... This speaks of how that with Paul and the Thessalonians, there was a time of separation. When we have those who graduate, who go off into living their adult lives, it's not uncommon that there is a time of separation between them and those who are parts of the church. And we see that that is the case often in their lives. But Paul gives a word of encouragement saying, we were orphaned by being separated from you for a short time, in person, not in thought. Take that to mean that no matter where you go, no matter what you're doing, even though we are not with you physically, we are with you in our hearts and in our minds, and we hold you as such. We have with us to be recognized today, Sean Rice, he was baptized here at First Presbyterian Church in April, the month before this month, but clear back in 2005. You were much shorter then, Sean. Much, how tall are you, Sean? Six, four. And we also have Keegan, who was baptized just last year in May, in the very, very same month on the 22nd. We as a church, you can be sure that we will keep you in mind because we have taken vows to nurture you. We nurture you when we are separated from you in our prayers and in our thoughts. So please know that, that that is something that we will continue to do and that we have been doing. This week, well, last week, <clears throat> I met with a female pastor who's a friend of mine in Dayton, Ohio. She's not quite as young as you, but she's much younger than most of us here. She's in her 30s. She's an associate pastor there, 
And she tells me that in the church that she, where she is pastor, that the majority of the leaders in her church, those who are active in serving, are actually the young adults. Those that are in their 20s and in their 30s, and Sean and Keegan, you're not far from that age at all, because I would guess both of you would be 18, maybe 19 years old. So isn't that something to hear, that there is a church just east of us where there is a young pastor in her 30s and that there are many of the leaders in that church where there are young adults. So many of us who are older adults think, oh, well, the young people are leaving the church. They're leaving the faith. But this is not true. There are young people who are actually living out their faith and who are great examples within their own congregations and their own communities. But it is, unfortunately, a pattern in most traditional mainline churches for attendance of young high schoolers or adults, or even junior high, to diminish when you start getting busy with life. Work sometimes does not let us be present on Sundays. We're working on Sundays. And then the pattern continues then into young adulthood when we enter college or enter the workforce, the age that you are. Nevertheless, the members of First Presbyterian vows, as I've already said, have taken vows of nurture. So whether you're here, present, or not, we do remember. And the question is, though, what do we do if we are separated? How do we nurture you? How do we show you care? Well, the way Paul showed care was to write a letter, this first letter and the second letter to the Thessalonians was a way of nurturing them. If we move on to chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, we hear of another solution. <clears throat> so when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and co-worker, in God's service and spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you in your faith. There's that takeaway, being strengthened and encouraged. So in other words, Paul wasn't able to go himself, an older father-like mentor, but he sent Timothy, who was another young adult, to go and be with the Thessalonians. So I pray that into your future, you will have the occasion of being exposed to faithful young adults who will strengthen and encourage you even when we cannot be with you. But what if you don't? What if there's not such a person who comes to, to be that to you? Well, there's another solution. Just like Paul wrote a letter, there are those who write um, books that can help strengthen us and encourage us. And so today, you are going to be getting as a gift a book. So Keegan and Sean, one of the gifts that you'll be getting, and anyone who is graduating, I would highly advocate for this book. You've heard me talk about it before. It's called Life Directions, Experiencing the Gift of God's Guidance. So this is a great book. It's also a great book for people who are retiring, entering other stages of life as well. So we're sending this book with you, in effect, as your Timothy, to go with you as you go into your life. So more on that later. But the question is, why was there even a need to be strengthened and encouraged? Let me ask Sean and Keegan, have you ever seen hardship in your life? Have you ever had times in your life where you need to be strengthened and encouraged? Maybe you don't know what life direction God is taking you in upon gra graduation. You need to be strengthened and encouraged. But another reason for it is as we go into the world, while we're in the church it happens too, but especially in the world, we will be faced with trials and temptations. So with that, we continue reading now in verses um, three through, actually we'll read all the way through 11. So that no one would be unsettled by these trials. That's why Paul writes, for you know quite well that we are destined for them. 
In fact, when we were with you, we kept telling you that we would be persecuted. And it turned out that way, as you well know. For this reason, when I could stand it no longer, I sent to find out about your faith. I was afraid that in some way the tempter had tempted you and that our labors might have been in vain. But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in our distress and persecution, we were encouraged about you because of your faith. For now we really live since you are standing firm in the Lord. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy we have in the presence of our God because of you? <clears throat> Night and day, we pray most earnestly that we may see you again and supply what is lacking in your faith. <coughs> And then Paul continues with a prayer. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts, listen to this, so that you will be holy and blameless <coughs> in the presence of our God and Father, when our Lord Jesus comes with all of his holy ones. And so here's that indication of the temptations and trials that will come and a prayer to be holy <coughs> and blameless. Last week, we read from the next passage. You might want to open your Bibles and look there. And chapter 4, <clears throat> in this passage, there is a specific temptation that is mentioned. The temptation of sexual immorality. It is something that young people have to face on the media, even in just television commercials, every day. We're praying that you will be kept back from suffering from that temptation and not fall into it. We're going to read another portion of this letter where another temptation is mentioned. Turn to chapter 5 on 1684. I'll be reading verses 1 through 11. Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write you, for you know for well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers and sisters are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. <coughs> you are all children of the light and children of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then, let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be awake and sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not point us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. He died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just in fact you are doing. So there's the temptations. Um, I used to hear the expression when I was growing up, why do you have to be out after 10 or 11 or 12? Up to no good after that time. That's what Paul implies here, and he specifically mentions the temptations of drugs and alcohol, alcohol specifically. So we're praying for you not to fall into these temptations. As a church, we actually have a means of reminding us every single day that we remember our vision and mission. If you'll look on the bulletin of our church, it tells us the, the vision of this church is to walk in the light of God not to walk in darkness, 
but to walk in the light. And it tells us our mission is making Jesus known as first at first. We pray for you to know that you are children of the light and that you will not fall into the temptations of darkness. Finally, we end with verses 12 through 13. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard and love because of their work. Live with peace in each other. You may be sitting here saying, here I am on my graduation, and the pastor is reminding us about temptations. We're saying we love you, but we're talking about these reminders. Why? Because we care about you. We don't want you to go into places that are not spiritually safe for you. When we admonish you, when we warn you, we are showing love. So don't be offended. Please know that this is part of your being loved. So don't take offense. Now let's get to the book, the book that's acting as your Timothy. I'm going to give you um, a summary of what appears as this book. I hope that you will not just put it on a shelf and forget about it, that, but you will be in the habit of reading it to strengthen and encourage you. I pray that you'll use this book as a source because it resorts to the Bible and also the Bible itself. The book is by Kais and Stark, Life Direction, Experiencing the Gift of God's Guidance. So first the book offers, that is presents, that there are four God-given methods of guidance through which his, the will of God gives us a specific way of finding God's will for our lives. They are these, scripture, special design, the Holy Spirit, and circumstances. So, but before employing any of these methods, we have to be in the right mindset. First, we have to make the most important choice of our lives. If you're trying to figure out what's next in your life, that choice should go back. I mentioned that both of you have been baptized, should go back to the baptisms. The choice that a parent made on your behalf because you were a little one, Sean, you didn't make the decision on your own to be baptized. Dawn, your mother made it for you and your grandparents made it for you. They stood there with you in their arms and made sure that you were baptized in the faith, wanted you to be nurtured and to carry that faith on every day of your life. So you, there was a choice made and that choice was the most important choice of your life, even though you hadn't yet made it yourself. But I hope at some point in your life, you've decided that I'm going to make a choice to practice the faith and to follow Jesus. Because that choice is the major choice that helps us get the right direction. Keegan, you made the choice of your baptism on your own. You said, this is what I want for my life. You were not, they wouldn't have been able to hold you, Keegan, when you were baptized. So you came forward on your own accord and you said, I choose to follow Jesus and I make this choice. So that's the most important choice. We need to choose and commit to God being the Lord of our lives, not ourselves or anyone else or anything else. God being first, making Jesus known as first. That means Jesus has to be first in our lives. Second, you ready for the second one? We have to, with that being in mind, we have to know that God's plans for our lives are better than our own plans. We have to know that God knows better than we do what the best plans for our lives are. Third, to know that, we have to be open to listening for God's voice and desire to hear his voice above any other. To hear his voice first, to be in the word of God and I think this book will help you and being in a community of faith is also another way but even with the right mindset and willingness to decide life's choices by these methods we also have to know this 
God's will for our life is not always obvious because it's particular. Yes, the will that God has for you is to be a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ, but what do I do in my career? I have to make money. I have to put bread on the table. I have to make a decision. It may not always be obvious. That's when this book comes in handy. And we have to trust, too, that God taking us through the process of discernment is entirely based, this is the most important thing, on God's love for you. You're seated with your family. Your family loves you. Your family loves you. All of our families love us. But the one who loves us and knows us more than anyone else is God, is Jesus. No one loves us more than him. So you need to know that. And know that his plan, his good plan for you, and his way to guide you to follow his will is all based in love. If you don't know that, you have a serious deficit and we'll probably get off track. We want you, I think all of us here can put up our hands and say, we want you young men to know how much God loves you. So there are four guide, guidance systems. Much of what God's will is for us is already told in scripture. So scripture is the first guidance system. Scripture teaches us about God and about his steadfast love for us. But it also teaches us about us, at least in a general way. So how do we discern through the Bible? First, I want to give you a caution. Please do go to the Bible and discern. But make sure you know and you look to the whole of the word. Don't just pick out a single verse. There's a joke about Timothy. There was a man who had a drinking problem, and he decided to get guidance from the Bible. And he opened up the Bible when Paul wrote to Timothy, the young pastor, and it said this, this man wanted, although he was in recovery, he wanted to take a drink, and he wanted to know what God said about that. So he opened the Bible, and he came to the verse that Paul wrote to Timothy says, don't just drink water, take a little wine. One verse in the whole of the scripture. That one verse led the man off course. He apparently didn't read what said in Thessalonians because this man was a recovering alcoholic and that one drink would get him to the point of being drunk and was not the right decision. So we have to look at the whole of scripture, not take a single verse out of context. And if we don't understand a verse, find people within the community of faith to help interpret it, but also know scripture interprets scripture only. If we weigh that verse with all of scripture, we would know that his choice was poor. So no scripture interpretation can go against scripture. What's the second method? The second method, this is the longest one that I'll mention to you, is about special design. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are here on this earth, in this world. Yes, I know that you are the product of your parents and your grandparents, but you would not have come to be if it weren't for God's decision to knit you together, Psalm 139, in your mother's womb. So the Bible's primary purpose is to help us to know God, but it's also to help us know about ourselves because no one knows us better than God. He's the one who created us and who continues to sustain our lives. And he does this through the Holy Spirit. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit works to transform us. Now, God does love us as we are, but he loves us far too much to leave us that way. If he left us in the condition that we were when we first came to him, that means we'd be living in darkness and sin. God has given us the Holy Spirit to transform us, to transform us in our hearts and minds so that we will have the heart and mind of Jesus Christ. Through the Holy Spirit, the image of God that was tarnished by sin, and we've all sinned, becomes restored. 
Now, how do we analyze and discern God's will for us through our special design by how we are made? We do it through analytical skills. It's not something that's out there. We could actually sit down and we could weigh choices. We can look at the time. Is it time for this? We can look at values. Today we just had a review with one of our staff members and we have values of our church. And the staff member sat down with us and said, yes, I support the values of the church. Do we stay within the values? Do we keep biblical values? And the Holy Spirit gives each of us gifts. Keegan and Sean, you each have gifts. Maybe your family has told you what they are. Maybe a teacher, that happened with me when I was seven years old. Maybe, maybe someone who taught you in Sunday school at one point or another told you your gifts. And we should live into those gifts. The point is, we all are made by special design and each of us is, are different. Not all of us do the same thing. What if the world was full of nobody who did anything but being mechanics, right? Or who worked in computer systems. We need people of many different gifts for the work of God's kingdom to be done. The next manner of discerning is if we would listen to the Holy Spirit directly rather than listening to others, that we listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. But how do we know when it's the Holy Spirit talking to us rather than our own interior voice or rather than the influence of others over us? Here's how. You ready? The Holy Spirit has the same character of the other persons of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit have the same character. One of those characteristics, the most important characteristic, is the characteristic of God is love. From 1 John chapter 4. But God is also light. 1 John chapter 1. So the Bible tells us who God is and his characteristics. And if he's transforming us to be more like God, that when we hear a voice that is not full of truth, full of life, full of love, that it is not the voice of God. The Holy Spirit also always glorifies Jesus, points to Jesus, just as Jesus always glorified the, the Father. The Holy Spirit's not self-centered. The Holy Spirit does not co contradict himself in scripture. He always acts in, um, in unity. When there is conflict and confusion, that is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot speak in different voices and interpretations. He speaks in one unified direction. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, just as Jesus is. What the Holy Spirit conveys is God's will will come to pass. If it doesn't happen, it is not according to the Spirit. I know sometimes we think about doing one thing in our lives, and we've decided, no, that's not what we're going to do. We're supposed to take a different path. We may wonder, am I making the right decision? Well, if it doesn't come to pass, it's not God's will. God's will always comes to pass. The fourth and final method is working through circumstances. Pay attention. What doors have opened and what doors have shut. When a door closes, Ask God why, especially if you thought it was a direction that you should go. And trust Jesus, because he says he is the door and he is the gate. Also discern within the body. Ask other believers their thoughts. Ask your family, who are members of the faith, what are their thoughts. Other believers can help in the discernment. Now, one of the most important things that you can do, pay attention to this, and I hope this is part of your life now. Of course, stay in the scripture, but also pray constantly. Paul writes so many times. This is one of the most imperative words that are stressed in scripture. Prayer is our listening to God, not just talking to God. So don't, we don't go to God like he's a vending machine saying, I want this, I want that, I want this but to say, Lord, I need your help. I don't understand. And pray constantly. 
So today's message, the scripture and the gift of, gift of this book, is to strengthen and encourage you, and nurture and in love. Please accept these words as such, but as much as we love you, we want you to know the truth that Jesus loves us most of all. In his holy name we pray and offer you these words. Amen. We have a song of response. Remember, this is to strengthen and encourage you. It's a hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee, hymn number 33. We want that to be the direction of your life, that you will constantly look up to Jesus, constantly look for God's will. So let us stand together and respond. Hymn number 33, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. Leslie Crawford has come forward to um, give the gifting to our youth. You may be seated. We have two high school graduates with us this morning. Um, Keegan, Sean. But before I introduce them, have them come up front, I would like to uh, talk about our college graduate uh, who is unable to be here with us today, and also her parents, Jamie and Mike Bowlby. They're down collecting uh, Owen from college. Reagan was a senior in high school where there was no prom, no senior day, and even a graduation where she could walk across the stage in front of her peers and her loved ones and receive her diploma and a lot of other things that seniors get to do but could not do. And that was in the year 2020. And I bring this up because she has accomplished a lot. And in my prayer, I had brought up challenges and difficulties. Reagan is graduating 
from George Washington University, magna cum laude, and she did it in three years with a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and American Studies. She will continue to live in Washington, D.C., even after her graduation, which is May 21st. Reagan is currently the press intern for Senator Sherrod Brown, and she intends to pursue her master's degree while working full time. So as you see, even when facing the challenges and the difficulties in life, in your high school, days weren't what you thought they were going to be. There's always some way, somehow, to get things accomplished. And I just wanted to mention her because that 2020 class, they lost a lot. Certainly, uh, the graduates of, of these young people are part of our prayers of joy today. Usually, this is the week when we recognize our birthday and anniversary, but we decided that the cake was devoted to the graduates this Sunday, so you'll see that. But anyone who has a birthday and anniversary this month, we still celebrate you as well. If you'll turn um, to the prayers in the bulletin, especially the back page, you'll see lots of red. This week, I felt inclined to look at who was on the prayer list and to make some phone calls and to check in with those who were on the prayer list. And I'm glad I did because I learned about prayer needs that were beyond those that we knew and also got some updated prayer reports. A number of which was, were good news. We heard that Fran Hungerford, who had a new PET scan, still shows she's cancer-free. Amen. We hear that Jim Charles is doing well after a procedure, but that he will have an x-ray on May the 21st. And Randy Conaway is still going for his monthly treatments, and he will have uh, be checked in July to see if he's still cancer-free. Randy went with me to National Day of Prayer, so we represented, and uh, we were just, we were with a group that was praying for health concerns, and Randy was an excellent voice to talk about the healing power of Jesus Christ and to celebrate that as we were together at this day of prayer. We also have prayer needs um, for a scan for Dick Lord's sister, Darley, on May the 10th. That got changed to the 19th. Oh, it did get changed. Okay, I'm gonna make a little note on here. So now it's the 19th. When we do these bulletins, 
Um, that when I thought I was done with it, I had to keep sending it in three times and updates still keep happening. So it's good to be kept abreast of that. We also have um, others who are members of the Crawford family, the, their nephew who is having new symptoms of blackouts and Le Leslie's brother who needs a heart cath, and we were already praying for his wife, Samantha, for pain and recovery from black back surgery. We also have heard, yes? Blunt cath was on Friday. Okay. Eight stents are cleared. Oh my goodness, praise the Lord. Eight stents cleared, okay. Um, there are times where I'm out and about and ministering to people in the community and I pick up information from community members who need prayer. Um, one is Jean Hill, the husband of a local waitress who is recovering from surgery after a severely broken femur due to an auto accident causing him to be off work. Another one is Haley, the niece of a local waitre waitress who has, needs brain surgery and needs a diagnosis in the midst of that that's coming in May. But the news that I wanted to directly tell you about is I got a phone call and from the husband of Laura Kieser who had play, prayed for us, played for us as a part-time organist. And he called me to tell me that he now is in the advanced stages of esophageal cancer and he is in his last weeks of life in hospice. Um, I wanted to tell you face to face, so I put this in the prayer so that you continue to pray for him, but I want you to know this. Joseph knows Jesus. He, the day I talked to him, he encouraged and strengthened me in my faith, and I'm encouraging and strengthening you. He knows to whom he is going. He knows that he'll be with Jesus. He knows that Laura's there already. He is not the least bit afraid. He is ready, but I wanted you to know and not be caught by surprise. When I've asked him to let his stepchildren, they never had children of their own, to call me and let me know when the time comes. He is in a church and he's being very well cared for that church, but he thinks highly of us and wanted to get in touch with me firsthand. So I wanted you to know the situation because it was quite a surprise when I picked up the phone and heard it, he said, I guess you figured it's probably not good news because when at the end of Laura's life, life, I knew it wasn't good news either. But having said all that, Jesus is Lord. He intercedes for us. Let us pray. Gracious and loving Lord, there are so many reasons to be joyful. Most especially, we are to worship you and enjoy you forever. We do, we lift you up, we lift up your name, we lift up your character, we lift up who you are. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords, you are God Most High, you are on the throne and you never leave it. You reign always and we can trust in you and this we know with our entire hearts. Even those circumstances of life may try to knock us around and help us lose hope and faith and trust and be discouraged. We cannot allow that to be the direction of our beings because who you are is the most important thing. And we do trust in you. And you have given us many reasons to celebrate. Hard work that um, helping our youth go through, especially as Leslie mentioned, during COVID, there were many graduates who didn't get to celebrate in the same ways as others. We thank you for Reagan's achievements, for Keegan, for Sean, and for others. At the National Day of Prayer, we were sitting with youth. Randy and I got to pray with a little girl and we prayed for many of the youth in our communities. We're there with Good News Club and ministering to over 130 children between our church and Outville. We are looking forward to Vacation Bible School. We pray and we ask for your guidance. We celebrate too 
um, birthdays and anniversaries and new births and different stages of life, O oh Lord, keep us always on your path. We've already raised the names of these many people who need your prayers, O oh Lord, who are on our list. But at National Day of Prayer, we also prayed for our community. I want to lift up a special prayer today, O oh Lord, for our mayor, Mayor Mike, for our local government. Mike is a strong Christian man. He attends every pastor's meeting and is never shy himself about praying. We are blessed to be in a community that has a strong Christian leader. And also within um, our school district, there are those who are strong believers, whether they are administrators or teachers. We pray for businesses. We have a business owner within our community sitting here, Randy Conaway, who is a strong Christian. We have those who are in the field of health in our communities that are here, retired, and also who continue in their work. Melissa Holland, who works in a doctor's office. We pray for all these people that we know and those that we don't know, and we ask that you strengthen and encourage them in the faith, that they may be able to continue to make Jesus known, being first at first, through their being out in the world and a part of this community. Lord, we pray for leaders of all levels, international, national, regional, in our given county, in our cities. And we ask, Lord, that you guide and direct us all. We pray for those who are part of ministries, for those who are first responders. We pray, Lord, because you tell us through your word that you pray constantly, and therefore we should pray constantly too. So you have taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We are called to be God's stewards of all the gifts that he has given us, of all the time that he has given us, of every resource that he has given us. Would you consider in all the ways that you have been strengthened and encouraged in the faith to allow the offering and the tithe that you bring forward today to be a way of strengthening and encouraging the faith through your offering. Please hear now the offertory.
Let us pray. How small, O oh Lord, are those gifts that we offer in comparison to all that you give. But we know, O oh Lord, that through the power of your Holy Spirit, if we are willing sacrifices, and if we consecrate all in prayer, that you can even use the little things for great purposes, just like the young man who just gave two loaves and five fish. We ask, O oh Lord, that you bless these gifts and that they be used to convey your will and the goodness of your kingdom to the world. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand, let us affirm our faith from the Apostles' Creed in unison. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. To our graduates gathered here and all else, let us sing hymn number 39 from Hymns of Faith, remembering always of God, great is thy faithfulness. Amen. 